Hi, I'm Rebecca Carbon. This is a video series uh, put out by Art Plus Public Unlimited, where we bring you behind the scenes look at Canadian artist practices. We're particularly interested in uh, this season of our series with uh, collaborative practices in the art world. So throughout this season, you'll hear from different team members um, as we dive into conversations with diverse artists and artist duos uh, who have various types of collaborative practices. So we hope you learn something new, whether it's discovering a new artist or something you didn't know about an artist whose work you may follow closely. Today, I am very pleased to be joined by Jennifer Marmon and Daniel Borens of Marmon and Borens to chat about their shared practice. Jennifer Marmon and Daniel Borens have been making large format sculpture, paintings, mixed media, installation and electronic art since the year 2000. Their projects extend through galleries, museums and into public space. In the studio, Marmon and Borens work in a materials-focused practice, combining conceptual art with visual appeal, where they produce complex projects that tell stories, often conceiving of exhibitions as intertwined and narrative-based perspectives. Their artworks are situated within popular culture, examining questions of authenticity while simultaneously referring to aspects of both modern and recent history through speculative narratives and the effects of the digital age. Marmon and Borens have lectured at galleries and institutions both nationally and internationally, including University of Calgary, Tulane School of Architecture, and SOMA in Mexico City. Jennifer Marmon is a graduate of the University of Western Ontario, and Daniel Borens is a graduate of McGill University. And Marmon and Borens both graduated from the Ontario College of Art and Design, where they started their collaboration. Marmon and Boren's work is in numerous collections, including the National Gallery of Canada, the Art Gallery of Ontario, the Art Gallery of Hamilton, University of Toronto, York University, and the City of Toronto. They are represented by Kristen Tierney in New York, um, where their third solo uh, show opened June of this year, 2023. So hello, Jennifer and Daniel. Uh, I would love to start off with asking you to tell us a little bit about yourself and your practice in a sort of open-ended way. What does your studio practice currently look like? Um, our studio practice looks like we just finished a big show. Um, and that show just opened in uh, Calgary, at Contemporary Calgary. Um, uh, this being right now, um, October of 2023. The show continues into 2024, and then it's touring to uh, other institutions. So it looks like we've just done a whole bunch of stuff uh, for the past uh, two years. And um, then we're looking at uh, the future ahead of us. So various um, public art projects, um, solo shows in um, commercial galleries, and then this tour. Um, you know, uh, telling you a little bit about us uh, beyond that. Uh, well, we've always been interested in materials. We have an interdisciplinary practice uh, with a variety of presentation formats. Um, we uh, formulate narratives that have varying degrees of social, media, political, and historical responses. Um, we have been collaborating for over 20 years. So, you know, what, what has influenced that? Well, you know, over 20 years ago, there were fewer resources. There was a bit of a, uh, like an energy issue with um, the artist run centers at the time. And there were few opportunities for late gen Xers. Um, Baby boomer artists were teaching us and they were sort of in their mid career. And the 90s were great. They were a period sort of of like um, self actualization. The world seemed uh, much more peaceful. We were getting over the Cold, Cold War era. And um, there was a lot of influence uh, from the indie world, indie, indie music. And Toronto was a great place then because real estate uh sort of in a funk rent was low um so we were really started out in indie art uh diy uh presentations um ex experimental uh practice um and then on the other hand fabrication has been an influential part of our practice at that time 
OCAD was really interested in its shops and in fabrication and um, developing technique through practice. Um, so that was a major factor. And then pop culture, the, the sort of the television age uh, coming out of the uh, 80s and the 90s um, has always been important to us. Um, and that we translate into a uh, conceptualism with mainstream appeal. So that's one, one of the things that we really try to work on. And all of those things, we think that these approaches dovetail nicely and align with uh, art in public or, or public art or uh, temporary uh, projects in public art. So that that's sort of a, a nutshell. Yeah. Uh, and and to maybe- that, I would add um, more detail about perhaps the approach of our practice or, or how we were approaching um, the art that we were creating. So at the beginning of the practice, um, we were very project-based in our approach, um, meaning that we were looking at large ideas, but in single iterations. So we weren't necessarily concerned with authorial style or multiple iterations in a progressive series work. This was probably because we were working as a collaboration from the very beginning. Um, so we were interested in decentering authorship. Um, but that being said, people who know our practice, um, I think over time they can see lines of thinking, both visually and narratively. So we have defined a style or way of working. Um, and a, at a certain point in our practice, a uh, critical mass of works formed. We decided to embark on solo exhibitions. That was a natural evolution and museum exhibitions followed. So this approach also combined temporary projects, public art, um, architecture and design projects. So we our, our studio practice uh, for the past well, they say we're now in periods, right? But for the past uh, 10, 15 years has been relatively consistent and shows um, specific areas of focus. Originally starting out, it was like uh, indie DIY uh, pop-up shows uh, in a network of um, indie galleries, exchanges with uh, different cities. Uh, back then, artists from different cities practiced in different styles uh, since uh, the advent of, of social media. There's kind of like a monoculture that has happened. So, um, but going back to us, um, the areas of our practice are uh, like, let's say museum shows. So museum shows take a while to produce when the work is new, right? So we, we debut, we often debut uh, new works in museum shows. Um, so those those take uh, you know, at least a year, uh, sometimes more to produce. Then there are uh, gallery shows. Um, you know, so uh, artists need to show their work. Uh, they they should do gallery shows if possible. They should do museum shows. Gallery shows are usually based on a uh, a single concept or study um, uh, and a, or, or an approach that we build context around. Um, the gallery world um, is a little less forgiving in terms of uh, interdisciplinary uh, multiple approach exhibitions. But I think we we probably will return to that a few times uh, in, in the next few years. So there's single, like um, these are the splatters, and then there are 10 splatters, or there's uh, interdisciplinary. Here's a, a variety of different material approaches uh, around an idea. Uh, the um, sort of a stereotype or uh, the best practice is single idea repetition. Um, the thing that's maybe more interesting is an interconnectedness of uh, different objects um, within our style, like within a, a style that is ours, 
um, that tie together. Um, then there are temporary projects. So we've often done festivals or uh, large group shows or um, uh, you know uh, things that have a time a, a, a different time limit than a museum show um, or a gallery show. Uh, and then there's uh, public art. So this is influenced um, contrary to, I don't know what people might assume, uh, public art kind of is defined by when opportunities uh, arise. Um, and public art is like regular art, but it involves uh, problem solving. That also considers architecture, design, art, and setting. So, and that setting being quite different from indoors, a gallery or museum. Um, and our public practice, we consider ourselves to be, you know, pretty, pretty well experienced um, in in this field. So, you know, no, none of this has gotten any easier. Like, it's not easy because we've done it uh, for a long time. That's a really. Um... I, I love how you're talking about, I mean, this is a really interesting behind the scenes look at how you just how you think about the different exhibition contexts and how that uh, and the implications in terms of what you're going to show, not just the not the work itself necessarily, but the, the thesis of what you're showing. So you think about each each um, exhibition and the context of it as an opportunity to kind of um, showcase your practice beyond just what that you know, what you're showing within the walls. It's really interesting to hear you speak about it that way. Can you, um, Jen, you mentioned uh, your interest in authorial decentering, and I think it'd be interesting for people to understand a little more about what you're, um, what you both mean when you're talking about that. Um, so you use paradox and authorial decentering as strategies to mirror political landscapes and kind of social commentary. Can you share some actual examples of uh, what you mean by this in terms of an approach that's manifested in your work? Um, you want a specific example of work? Just, just to kind of when you when you're yeah when you're speaking about that, what how do people see that in um, an example of a work or an exhibition that they would have seen? Like what to help people understand what you mean? It's it's a big idea. What people the, are okay? Well, like the, the adjoinder is uh, so the expectation is that like it, like it predates World War Two. But for just the sake of, you know, the modern era, the, the expectation, so, so the MFA program um, uh, encouraged artists to practice in a, like a singular recognizable style and then be iterative of that single style um, so that in the market, uh, a person could recognize that and say, that's a so-and-so i can identify it and uh, without like without much w without much more so um coming from where we're coming from we're looking at an issue or a problem or an idea and we're seeing it as in a project sense and then working in a duo um and it, this is kind of interesting today uh, because working in a duo, um, some of the myths of art as magic or um, art as autonomy um, uh, are thrown into question. But then at the same time, we're in a period where artists might be at, at risk of, of losing their autonomy. So it's, it's sort of it's sort of ironic, but I, I think that um, the notion of the uh, individual artist felt odd for us because we suffer from some, you know some kind of a uh, some kind of a questioning of like um, what what the authentic is, and it can't possibly be that just because an individual makes something it's it's authentic um mm -hmm. so it's about it's also about problematizing the object or the artwork uh in the present day as an exploration as to um why why are we losing um a sense 
of authenticity and then what other factors play into that. So, so mass media, the uh, digital age, the information age. So it's, mm-hmm. so it's like um, authorial decentering is, is probably something like we would, we would use that term much less than 20 years ago, but I guess it, it has been attached to us and maybe authorial decentering um, is something that when groups work together or collaborations work together, that that um, helps to topple some myths about the artist. And, it, and if I could just extend that a little bit further, there, there's some belief that art is magic or art is healing or art has taken the place of um, you know, the religious relic um, and that we, or that uh, artists are um, somehow on the fringes of society, artists have special powers and so on and so forth. And then when, when two people or more are working together in a group, um, some, of, some of those perceptions are, are disrupted, like even problematically so for just members of the, the general public, like they just can't, they can't understand it. Because of, mm-hmm. because of all the myths that, that surround, that have been c- constructed around artists. And an extension of those ideas um, by questioning authorship or authenticity, I think we're also thereby giving greater agency to the viewer um, because they have a role in thinking about authorship and increasing their own agency. Um, thereby, we're creating a dialogue with the viewer, which I think is, is very important and been a concern of our practice from very early days. So we've always been interested in viewer engagement, um, but going f- further, viewer participation or interaction. Often, the artwork is not complete until um, the viewer is involved. Um, So through questioning our own agency, we're giving greater agency to the viewer at the same time and really creating a dialogue. So I would love to use that as a segue to talk about your public, your public art practice, because that's an, that's an area in which you are engaging with a viewer who isn't even necessarily there to have a conversation with art or to experience, you know, have an art experience. So can you tell me a little bit about thinking about this and what draws you to the idea of creating work for not only public spaces, but for, you know, public audiences that haven't sought out an art experience? And how do you believe, um, like, what role do you think art plays in that uh, creation of connections and sort of within public space? I I think we're drawn to public art because of the fact that we're, we're preoccupied with relationship with the audience and agency of the audience. So public art affords, as you mentioned, a a larger audience, a larger viewership. Um, In this way, I think the public forum is perhaps more egalitarian or more inclusive than a gallery space or museum space. Um, Just the process of public art, it involves public calls, juries, It's in some ways offers the artist more freedom. It's not um, as as, um, much of an entity as museums or galleries are. It doesn't have the same systems in place. It's less mediated by the institution of art. Um, But then as well, one of the reasons it appeals to us is it allows for projects at scale. Um, It's relying less on the art market and more um, being part of the social realm. Um, So as it relates to our practice, um, we're very interested in in the social realm. Um, This can mean the transformation of non-spaces into places, An example is the Donlands and our Water Guardians projects, or, you know, a a roadway that becomes a linear park that's activated socially. 
to art that ends up contributing to the formation of new neighborhoods. So placemaking, landmarks. Um, I think we, we always are aiming to have public art um, take a place and um, turn it into a socially activated space where the audience um, can take ownership and feel as though they're reflected in, in the public space or they have a role to play in the public space. It's interesting to hear you talk about that being a more free space because as someone who, and I, I sometimes worry about, um, I often worry about uh, art processes having to navigate through, you know, these other rules that are not set up for allowing um, art to happen and have to be really sort of pushed against a lot of the time in terms of, you know, just those those real like real world restrictions of putting something out into the public engineering and hydro and what's Mm -hmm. under the ground and safety and all these kind of things that feel like they could be just compressing ideas all the time so it's interesting to hear that it can be perceived the other way around as well that is that is cheering news uh it seems like we need to have a, a discussion um you know uh among smaller groups and and larger groups about just how important uh, art is in society. Um, we you, you do not have a society or or a culture if, if you do not have art. Uh, if art is not uh, visible in in the uh, public space, you don't have a good city. Um, all uh, cities throughout you know, uh, recent civilizations, several thousand years, have always built uh, landmarks. Um, they have uh, put efforts into uh, architectural gestures uh, that are impressive. They're not just purely uh, practical. We can't just only have uh, practical and base level uh, cost space. We um, we do have problems uh, in, in society with uh, meeting other cr- criteria, of course, like a affordable housing or even uh, tackling uh, poverty. Um, but uh, what what kind of uh, cities do we want to have if they are completely bleak and everything is repeated and the buildings aren't designed by architects and uh, there is no art? So uh, people go to um, places in the world to visit cities that have been, um, had been, um, maybe still are, uh, building art and architecture for several hundred, if not uh, thousands of years. So sh- we should be very careful careful about saying, um, you know, it is excess to produce art. Uh, I think it's a, it's a must have. And when it's in the public space, it's available to everyone. And it also is something which uh, people identify their place by or uh, they get a sense of pride and identity from. So um, it's just, it's, a, it's an important uh, perspective. So it's one of the reasons why we do this and we take it quite seriously when we're engaging in a public art project. We're thinking about all of that and then um, what will happen in the future? How will people, uh, read this, and we're really trying to imagine some role where we're thinking about societal uh, implications. Yeah, and that's exactly one of the um, one of the ch- challenges that I was, you know, referring to is that con- having to, and we unfortunately still seem to be in a period in a place where there is that justification required all the time, that there is that combating this idea that it is an excess or a flourish or something. And I agree completely, it's an essential part of um, creating human scaled, human centric um, places. And both of you mentioned, Jen, you mentioned this mm-hmm. idea of being having a, a kind of key role in turning a non-space into a place that people actually want to spend time and that socialization being part of a core part of how your practice kind of comes into the public realm and the other thing um daniel you mentioning that you know without things like this it's just repetition and i often think about um successful uh public artworks as things that are ruptures in that just 
you know, ruptures in the fabric that is kind of monotony of urban life. And then there's something that makes people even for a second, maybe think we would, you know, a little bit step back a little bit and think, what is going, what is going on here? What am I doing here? What are, what is everyone else doing here? What's the common thing? Um, yeah. It, if anything, it'd just be like uh, a guiding principle in terms of informed civic space. Mm -hmm. Let's have, let's have designed space. Let's 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 have amenities in that space. Um, let's have art. Um, these these are all uh, must haves in in building a, a good city. So you're you're um, talking. You're very adept at working with some of those materials that are the urban you know the materials of urban fabric anyway, and kind of turning um, using those for your own. Uh, for the insertion of an artwork in this kind of repetitive monotony, but with the same material language, industrial based materials and things. Can you, how do you think these materials contribute to the dialogue between your art and the surrounding environment? And do you, how does your use of these materials challenge um, some of those notions around artistic style and authorship and the role of, of art in the public realm? So for example, like your, your bridge, the, is it SMC bridge or S SFC. 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 That's a weird yeah. name because it's South South Financial Corp. Uh, um, which is, I think it is, but uh, uh, it's a good example of your artwork really taking the materiality of you know this public realm infrastructure. Um, so thinking about how you kind of work with that same material but turn it into so, uh, yeah. It's also it's also a good example of just of problem solving like to to continue with what we were saving okay. saying previously so it's like uh the limitations of that bridge like it, it had budgetary limitations too um so we're really trying to coax some form and gesture out of what is a uh an odd requirement which is the, the bridge really has to have an elbow it takes a turn uh, it takes a sharp turn which then in introduced an acute angle which then became the that was the moment of realization so we we're working with james camsey and we're like well this building is really like a triangle then that led to vortices um and the bridge captures um these uh vortex formations that are non-perspectival on the inside and then has a binding and wrapping gesture on the outside, uh, uh, you know, triangular windows, and then it has crisscrossing uh, uh, sort of brick patterns suggesting that it's he held together another way. So, uh, you know, like um, it could have been just a, like a nothing bridge, um, but then it started an era of interesting uh, pedestrian bridges in Toronto, and that started out of a, an impetus, which was how do we do how do we bring artists into a project treat an architectural project as public art which then ended up having um a like a societal uh kind of benefit which is pretty cool space people go there and they're going to the uh to the hockey game or the cn tower or the convention center and tons and tons of kids like they photograph themselves in that space so uh, I don't think we should laugh at the the role that uh, self photography plays in, mm -hmm. in in depicting identity in in public space. I, I think it's actually it's 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 something we should seriously uh, consider as as important. I mean, somebody's identifying with the space; they're in the space and in a space that could have been generic, but thankfully is not so uh just getting back from calgary there's a real concern like about winter um so a lot of pedestrian bridges were built between office buildings but it was in a previous era where not much design thinking was done so so they they tend to be rather generic um but subsequent subsequently uh from sfc bridge um I can I can I can think of uh, two or three other instances where some kind of pedestrian through fair through fair has been given um, a public art perspective. I think the um, selfie phenomenon I think is a really good uh, 
marker of exactly what we were talking about is creating, you know, it, it indicates a space that people feel some sort of, um, for whatever reason, they want to have their own image taken with that. There's a bit of a connection there, right, within within the space, and that's been created through um, through the art. So that, uh, the selfie phenomenon is an uh, interesting segue to a question about your, you have a really, um, I love that in your practice, you blend uh, high art formalism and, you know, serious theory with popular aesthetics. Um, when I, when we were putting this question together, I was thinking specifically of the ET, remember ET at Nuit Blanche many, many years ago? No, not yeah. ET, Yoda. <laughs> Well, uh, yeah, uh, Pieta, was, both of them combined. Pieta, yeah. Right, right. It was the Pieta. Uh, yes, exactly. Um, so you you have this kind of really amazing um, way of using ironic humor to cross these different, um, so this kind of spectrum of cultural product, if you will. Um, how do you believe this approach allows your audience to engage with your work more deeply and the kind of some of the really complex themes that you're exploring there. Okay. Um, well, Jen, you want to explain the Pieta and then we'll try to answer that or let's just start with that. Maybe. Yeah. In one, in one phase of our practice and, and we, um, we were really wanting to make, we were thinking of the audience, we were thinking of engagement we we're thinking of uh, a language to to use, and going back to you know television and movies. Um, one thing that's um, readily accessible to people are images and icons from mass culture. So that became for us a palette to use to speak directly um, and engage an audience. Um, so for Nuit Blanche, we wanted to make an event um, or an intervention, um, and it, we we created a scenario where we had um, caution tape and guardrails and smoke and I think a fire truck parked on the street um, and and a tent. And in this tent um, was the the center of this event um, and it was like a pieta with ET cradling Yoda right. in its arms right. and in fact healing Yoda um, with his finger. So, right. And then so to the like sometimes these realizations come later but there are people are like uh, uh, we have an eclectic practice like let's just let's say it on a polite terms like actually that project closely aligns with what we've just shown at Contemporary Calgary. It's actually a temporal art installation that is has some situation that has been provided, uh, which then has mass participation, which is like a faux lying in state. So people are lining up to go through this tent, but then they're seeing um, religion recast as popular culture in an inter-movie kind of like memeplex, pre-social media, mm -hmm. pre the advent of contemporary, easily accessible photo collage. But then a simultaneous uh, part of the installation, which is in Alien Crash, um, so that something has happened at the site. So, so we're thinking about uh, dynamics of time uh, interaction of the audience and agency. And we're doing that in a previous era where we, we did tend to be interested in uh, a de democratization um, of images. So we, you know, we saw the Thomas Demand show and we we're like, hey, actually we were doing that. It wasn't necessarily through uh, social photography, but we were mixing uh, high culture and popular imagery uh, quite seamlessly. And now I think the the references to specific pop culture would be far, far fewer in our practice. Like we, we, we wouldn't necessarily go there, but we would make something in a popularizing 
style. Um, About like meta pop culture, like you referred to the selfie, the selfie phenomenon as kind of like pop culture practices rather than specific references. Sure, like uh, yeah. like meta meta selfies, uh, meta selfie culture. <laughs> <laughs> that um, that'd be something that we support. So when people are putting themselves into interesting environments and then depicting themselves in those interesting environments that are cultural, I think we're better off in culture. But it also it has created selfie art, which you know, which some people so there's there's always a it's always a double edged sword because there are I don't know, there's always these elect priest type people who um have their uh beliefs, well that's that's terrible because that's selfie art, right? Uh or there can be the people who you know, this is this is great because when people yeah. are engaged in art, they'll depict themselves. So um, it, it all falls back to our strong belief in the idea of engagement. Mm -hmm. um, the idea that a work or an installation or an intervention mm -hmm. should offer a strong viewing experience first and then lead to um, meaning, accessible levels of meaning and then, you know, further levels of meaning. So I think we use, in the past, we used mass culture, popular culture. Um, humor plays the same role. It breaks down barriers for the audience. Um, I think it makes the art more accessible, maybe more exciting. Um, art is no longer something sacred that's good for you. It allows doors to open. Um, and then I think... Again, it's all about communication, dialogue with the audience, and mm -hmm. a mass accessibility. I, uh, I like what Jen says because it would be uh, 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 like about the, I think it was a like morality or something like that. Um, it, it would be a mistake to have a culture where all artists have to work for a moral imperative that is a, uh, a monolith somehow. So, um, I think we have been advocates for this is a huge story where everybody has uh, a role to play and, and we need variety. So what happens is like the the AGO opens a, a, a cause exhibition um, with, uh, oh, sorry, uh, the mirror room. Um, Kusama. Yeah, Kusama. Kusama um, with, with Kusama, um, I mean, the the selfie um, phenomenon uh, arises. So you'll, you'll you'll have it's great. An institution might uh, move back and forth between the the popular, the moral, the historical, yeah. and so on. There, there there needs to be that variety because con the the con contemporary art is an open user system. It's one of the best systems ever because everyone can contribute to it. But it does need reflexiveness, um, and it does need challenge, and it does need uh, polemics, right? So the, the classical example being the polemic between the pop artists um, and the minimalists. Like, just you know, think about think about that two movements happening at the same time that couldn't be more diametrically opposed. So, so we need that in art. We need a rich variety of ideas, and we need to be open to discussing them all. Uh, and, and considering them, um, taking back to a public art discussion, the dumbest and worst thing that a society can do is act like Toronto did when uh, the Henry Moore Archer was installed um, at City Hall. So that's like the Simpsons, right? Um, uh, uh, Mayor uh, Quimby, right? Um, and some ridiculous thing that is made fun of for, for all time. So a, a moronic uh, culture, but now a very rich and, and vibrant one that celebrates those those Henry Moore sculptures. I want to, I have a one, um, I mean, I, you just answered that question in a way that completely talked about this blend of pop culture reference and higher formalism in a, it was terrific. Um, so I'm going to leave that one where it is. I want to ask one closing um, question that's quite uh open-ended before we wrap up 
um, because we've talked about um, some of your influences and references. We've talked about the, the acts of problem solving and collaborative practice and dialogue. And we've talked about the role of um, the engagement of audience at the end. So I would love for it to just spend a couple minutes on talking about what the process of making art is for you in terms of a kind of beginning, middle, and end. And I'm always interested to hear from artists around when they know a piece is like when they consider a piece done because it's different for everybody and I don't know whether it's ever actually done or you've just you've finished with it for now for some for some people um but I'd love to know yeah just a, a couple words from each of you on the process of making art and that kind of beginning middle and end idea of uh making art it's, it always starts as a discussion um and then we're as far into our practice as we are. It's um, been um, over 20 years. So it, it's also reflexive. Um, so we create using a sounding board approach. Um, we want to move the practice forward, but we're thinking, is this part of the practice or not? Um, so as far as the discussion, um, it can often um, be issues-based. Um, we're starting with things happening in the world, um, our reactions to them or observations, um, but then it can also be much more um, about making, um, more obsession-based, starting with certain areas of focus and then our desire to overcome a challenge, a fabrication challenge or a material challenge um, so there are ideas, there are materials, there's fabrication, um, but really it, all of that is part of the discussion. And so it goes from the discussion to, um, you know, something more formalized on paper or notes, then onto the computer screen, maybe renderings. Um, but along the way, it's always problem solving and finding the optimal solution, um, thinking about what is the right metaphor? Um, how can we visually express this idea? Um, so, um, so many different considerations and so much back and forth and discussion um, mm -hmm. in advance of even starting to make the artwork. Mm -hmm. It could also be, it's a, it's selection based from a compendium of not made things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, not made things uh, being noted or things that we, or a topic that we discuss about, you know, this not made thing, uh, then seems to then find a place, right? So then there's a commitment, like really the commitment is time and, um, and the physics of like, you know, the, the work becoming physical. Um, it is not, this so it's terrible to say what it's not but it's it's not poetry or romanticism and it's not ready-mades like which are over a hundred years old where it's just a you know challenge to tropes um in the museum it's not crumpling a piece of paper and um saying ah oh, i've made art because i'm you know i'm this because uh, i'm an artist yeah because i'm an artist that that stuff is is very very old um, it is about a sort of like, you know, dare I say senior artist, like mid career going into senior artist, um, uh, type mentality where we are shoring up, um, some of the good stuff and tying some of the loose ends together. So it's like the, the thread is, uh, caught in the act national gallery of Canada. So large set of installation circumstances, then a uh, project for New American Century at uh, our gallery of York University to the collaborationists, which debuted at our gallery of Hamilton to Three Dimensions, which just debuted at Contemporary Calgary. So there's a little bit of uh, how do we advance our practice, tie together what is now seeming to be chapters 
but also speak to the contemporary time, but not make it, don't make it obvious. Like don't take the five pillars that the Canada Council is uh, foisting on everybody. It's how do we do it? Um, it's our choice uh, as to how it's going to be expressed. And then as artists, we're also thinking about, is this lasting? Because like, it's not that immediate from conception of the idea to realization to the showing time. So how is this going to land? Uh, you know, sometimes, like, sometimes it can land badly because people are obsessed with the latest, the season of fashion in, in New York or, or London. Um, but usually it, it lasts pretty well in the archive, like in the tying of, of things all together. So I, I think we're editing those ideas. We're, we're discussing them, um, but we're also deciding when they're going to land. And it's like on paper or on the computer screen, then into study. Um, you often, as an artist, get no opportunity to workshop. So the people in the other arts who think art making is easy, well, theater people get to workshop their their play. Um, novel writers have uh, editors. Um, um, uh, musicians can uh, practice and perform. You know, several times after. It's a it's a quite a strange thing with art because if it's a complex show, it like everything has to work. For, for the show for that one time there's no there's no going back if it's touring sure like there could be mm -hmm. some adjustments it's a it's a it's a very strange thing like uh um it's got to land and you, you know you got to nail it right for the for the opening thank you very much to both of you um I've been, we've, I mean, we were talking before we hit record. I think we met in 2006 and have worked on a number of, a number of projects across the years, both realized and not realized. Um, there have been some great projects that haven't, that haven't happened yet. Um, so it's been really, but it's, so we've had many off, uh, off camera conversations. Mm -hmm. It's been really, really, really nice to share some of this uh, with both of you today. Uh, on camera, and I'm looking forward to sharing it with our audience, um, with our pub plus public. Do you have any particular kind of upcoming announcements you want to share as we just before we sign off? I know you've got um, Contemporary Calgary just opened. How long is that open until? So it's like uh, like four months, so going into 2024, and then look out for three dimensions uh, happening in other institutions uh, starting uh, summer of 2024 and beyond. So I think that's the that's what we want to share with audiences right now. Uh, otherwise, you know where to find us for the latest news. Thanks so much, both of you. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>